Okay, so um, thank you very much for uh, organizing this uh, meeting and for the invitation. And uh, in this uh, siesta time, I would like to talk about sub manifolds, that's important data, not surfaces, and think about the theorems. So, this is a quite uh, classical talk. And uh, I mean, the whole uh, workshop, this is devoted to singularities. And singularities are really, I mean, I'm talking about the core of why singularities are important in, in gravitation. Because they happen to be important due to these results, which are the singularity theorems, that are, they are telling us that there are something that happens in, in many physically realistic situations when you are dealing with gravitation. And this is independent of, say, uh, the existence of the cosmic sensor, and it is also independent of gear. This is based on Lorentzian geometry. You only need to assume some conditions on the curve. So it's a quite central thing if you are wanting to develop some lights. And this is um, the outline. So I will give a, basically an introduction, and uh, then I will introduce the new way of thinking about trap surfaces and how this can be extended to arbitrary submanifolds independently of the dimension of the submanifold. So this is quite important. And then I will just go on to prove that the singularity theorems are still valid and some applications. So this all started with the right Chaturi equation and then this famous Penrose singularity theorem in 1965. So this is the basic singularity theorem. And as you can see, it assumes several things like the existence of the Cauchy hypersurface and uh, some non-convergence condition and also something which has become very, very important in the gravitation, which is the existence of a closed trap surface. Now, we all know that the closed trap surface is a compact surface which has the non-expansions negative. So this is the traditional definition, but I'm going to see that this, there are more natural ways of defining these trap things. Uh, and then, of course, the most important or classical theorem is the one by Hoffman Penrose. This is the theorem. You have to assume some conditions, causality, and others. And then they give you three uh, choices. Either you want to put a closed acronym set in your manifold, or a closed trap surface, or a point with the converging light cone. Now, let me uh, remark that this is a set with dimension n minus 1, if n is the dimension of the manifold, so the co-dimension is 1. This is co-dimension 2, and this is co-dimension n, where you want this a point that has dimension 0. So if you are in four dimensions, you can deal with 1, 2, and 4. So what happened with 3? Why 3 is not there? And of course, if you are in the higher dimensions, what happens with all submanifolds when it comes to 2 and minus 1? Is there a problem with those? Now, I'm going to argue that there's no problem. The only thing is that one has to reorganize things. So everything can be done in arbitrary dimension. And this is my, the main thing of my talk. Now, in order to do that, we need the unification concept of the trapping for arbitrary dimension. And this is going to be a very simple thing in geometry, which is the mean curvature vector. So I will just uh, give now some uh, basic no notions in uh, mathematics of some manifolds, just to reach the idea of what is the mean curvature vector. So as a manifold, we can think of this as a surface, but the important thing is that I'm not going to assume anything about the dimension. So this has an arbitrary dimension, and therefore an arbitrary co-dimension. So n is the dimension of your space-time, and n uh, is the co-dimension. Right? So 
now and the, the middle code I mentioned. This is embedded. This can be done in many ways. For example, you can use parametric equations. So these are your coordinates in the space time. And these are some uh, intrinsic coordinates in your two manifold. And then you just see parametric equations. And of course, you can compute the tangent vectors. These are vectors tangent to the sub manifold as seen on the space time. And of course, the first fundamental form is nothing but the metric on the sub manifold when you want the pull back of the metric. Now, I'm going to assume that all my sub manifolds are space like. This is the same as saying that the first fundamental form is definite, positive definite. Now, given that this is positive definite, you can decompose any object into, uh, into tangent and normal parts. In particular, if you take the covariant derivative of tangent vectors along tangent vectors, they will give you a tangent part and a normal part. The tangent part is nothing but the connection. This is the Levitsky interconnection of the first fundamental form. And then the other thing is called the shape tensor or second fundamental form vector. Now, this is the main object. Okay? This is the extrinsic curvature or the extrinsic properties of the symmetric. As I said, this is called the shape tensor. Now, of course, uh, this has like two indices which live on the sub manifold and then another index. This happens to be a normal index. And then if you choose any normal to your sub manifold, then you can define the second fundamental form, which is nothing but a contraction. So given any normal vector, you have a second fundamental form. But if you have many normal vectors, then you have many second fundamental forms. In principle, if your co-dimension is M, there are M independent normals. Uh, actually, if the co-dimension is greater than 1, all of them could be chosen to be null. And therefore, in general, there are going to be M independent second fundamental forms. Now, just for the terminology, if they correspond to null normals, they are called null second fundamental forms. Now, the mean curvature vector is nothing but the, I mean, the trace of the shape tensor. So, you have to observe that this is the vector field which is orthogonal to the summary. Now, if you take the trace of the second fundamental form, this gives you the mean curvature vector. Now, if you contract it with this with any normal, this gives you the traces of the second fundamental forms. And this is what we usually call the expansions. So for every normal, you have an expansion, which is nothing but the component of the mean curvature vector on that normal. As before, there are n independent expansions. If they correspond to null normals, then they are called null expansions. Right. So this is the definition. I mean, this should be the modern definition of the trap surface. And of course, it has been there for a long time now, but if people uh, stick to the original definition by then. Now, if you have a sub manifold, you are going to say that this is trapped or trapped in the future if the mean curvature vector is time like on future point. That's it. And of course, you can do the same to the past. Look, this is a genuine uh, Lorentzian geometry property. If you are in Riemannian geometry, I mean with the positive definite metric, then the main curvature vector has a norm which is positive or zero. And if it is zero, the vector itself is zero. So there is, there is nothing in Riemannian geometry but minimal to manifold, which is when the mean curvature is zero. But if you are in Lorentzian geometry, you can have the mean curvature vector with a norm which is zero without the mean curvature vector being zero, and also the norm can be negative. And these are the new things, and these are actually trapped things. So, observe that if H, the mean curvature is time-like and future pointing, then it doesn't matter uh, which, uh, with which normal that you contract here, all the expansions are going to be negative if M is to the future. So in principle, I mean, uh, 
This is the definition of now a trap surface, H is time like future. If you only assume that H is future pointing, but it comes in time like to now, then it is called weekly trap. If it is now pointing always to the future along one of the null directions, then this is marginal trap. And if it is only now that it can point to the past, then it's marginally out the trap. Okay, now, uh, this may sound like a too geometrical thing. Can we connect this with the traditional definitions? Well, obviously, yes, because of this property, but just let me insist. Take the traditional case of co dimension 2. Then, uh, if you have co dimension 2, you have two independent normals. You can choose them to be now if you want. If you choose them to be now, you can also add this normalization condition. Then the null expansion, I'm going to denote them by theta plus and minus. And the mean curvature vector can be written like that. This is obvious. Now, of course, saying that these two things, theta plus and theta minus, are negative is the same as saying that H is time by component. So the traditional condition, which is both null expansions negative, is obviously, obviously equivalent to H being time like and future. So similarly with the manual trap case, you put one of these two expansions to be zero, and then this is now a future point. So one recovers the traditional things. Okay, so now we have the concept of trap submanifold. It doesn't matter which dimension the submanifold has. Now that we have this uh, concept of traps and manifold, can we use them to prove singularity theorems? Well, the answer is yes, and uh, I'm going to discuss this. So first I need some uh, um, notation and uh, to prove the existence of focal points. So this is the version of conjugate points, but when you have some manifold. So the notation is better explained in this uh, drawing. And then I will go back to the notation. So this is your sum manifold, any dimension. Now if you take any point on your sum manifold, and you choose a normal, which is future point, to be time-like or not. Now, you uh, uh, just uh, launch here, or do whatever, the unique geodesic, which passes through that point with that tangent vector. And this is gamma here. Then, along gamma, of course, you have the tangent vector field, which I use the capital of the same thing as the sum manifold. And if I choose a set of linearly independent tangent vector fields up to the sum manifold, I can also parallel propagate them along gamma. And they will give me a set of vector fields along gamma which happen to be always orthogonal to n. And of course I use that always this idea of if I have a capital letter, then when I put this back to the submanifold, then I get the original the small letter. So now you, I go back to the notation. So this is any normal, which is future pointing. This is the geodesic. I use u to denote the affine parameter along the geodesic. So this is the normal, sorry, the tangent vector to the geodesic. This is the propagation of the original tangent vectors. And now observe that if you compute this quantity, due to the parallel propagation, this is independent of u, of the affine parameter. So this is always equals to gamma, the first fundamental form. In particular, you can construct this thing here, which at u equals zero on this manifold is the projector. Um, to the submanifold, so it's orthogonal to the normal. But this is defined now, so this is like taking the projector and parallel propagating it on the vector. So this is an object that I want you to remember, and this is the main result. So now you have any submanifold of any dimension, and you take any normal, which is future pointing. Now, if the expansion along that normal is negative, and if this condition is satisfied, and this is the key condition, along uh, the geodesic, then there is a point which is focal to the submanifold along gamma, 
as of the code this parameter. And uh, given that this is an important equation, I'm going to write it on the board. So this is just the contract with n twice, and then with p. So this going to represent zero is one. Okay, um, you, if you have been reading Hawking and his book, or Wolf's book, or any other standard book, maybe you remember that in order to prove the existence of conjugate points, or the existence of focal points, then you use the right Chaudhuri equation. And here we are not using the right Chaudhuri equation, we are using something which is called the energy index form, but, of course, one can always go back to the right Chaudhuri equation. Now, if you remember, in books, they always deal with the case of four dimension 1 or 2. So these are geodesics orthogonal to a, to a space like hypersurface, or orthogonal to a surface, or a four dimension 2. Why? Well, and this is the answer. Observe, if you are dealing with a space like hypersurface, then there is a unique normal which is time one. And then, sorry, then there is a unique n, and of course if you contrast, co con construct this p, this looks like that. But then when you come here and you put p, there are too many capital n's there, and they disappear. You only get the trace with the metric, and then your condition becomes the traditional convergence condition. So my condition for co-dimension 1 is the traditional time by convergence condition. If you go to co-dimension 2, the same happens. Now there are two independent normals, I choose them to be null, I call them N and L. I define capital, define capital L by parallel propagating this on um, the heuristic, and then P becomes this thing here. And again, when I put this P here, there are too many Ns all the time. So again, I get the rich contact with this null normal greater than or equal to zero. And this is the non convergence condition. So my result recovers the previous results using the right value equation. Now, what is the interpretation of this condition? Now, if the co dimension is greater than two, I mean, for co dimension one or two, I have already explained that this is the convergence condition. If the co-dimension is greater than 2, this can be given mathematically in terms of uh, sectional curvatures, or if you want to do physics in terms of tidal forces around your geodes. So I remind you that this sectional curvature relative to a given plane, here E is a space like orthogonal vector to N, then this is defined like that. Given that I take n to be the unit, then there is a minus here. And then this condition is nothing but summing this over all possible e's, which is of which are orthogonal. So in a way, this is like saying that the sum of the all possible sectional curvatures are non-positive. If you want this in the physical terms, this is a statement about the attractiveness of the gravitational field, in the sense that the tidal force in directions which are initially orthogonal to your geodesic is, on average, attractive. Now, uh, this is the curvature condition for time-like. If you do it for now, normals, then, then you use this uh, uh, refined definition, and then you can do exactly the same. These are called mass sectional curvatures and then you can do exactly the same interpretation. So what can we do with this uh, curvature condition now? Well, I remind you that the, there is a, an important set in causality theory, which is called the horizons. Uh, this is just, you take the causal future of a set and you subtract the, the chronological future. And this gives you something which in principle looks like a light cone. And in the uh, traditional theorems, the important thing is to get that something which has this to be compact. Now, 
the idea is that we can uh, recover this uh, compactness of this uh, E-class for arbitrary traction manifolds. And the idea is, I mean, this is the, the main result. If you have a trapture, sorry, traction manifold, and you assume your condition one along any now normal, then you can prove that this is compact or your space time is already incomplete. Now, with this result in your pocket, you can prove the converse and white theorem. And I want to remark that I have put here n less than 1 because if the co-dimension is 1, I don't have to assume anything. Because if the co-dimension is 1, you have a compact space like hypersurface, the E plus is itself, or it is included in itself, it is not a project. So you don't need to assume anything. So once you are here, you can prove the Penrose and White theorem. So this is just the, the Penrose theorem, as it was. But the only news is that you have you can assume a trap manifold of arbitrary dynamics. So you can use trap circles here if you want. And of course, the thing is that you have to, instead of assuming the convergence condition, which is a condition on the Ricci tensor, you have to assume this condition. If the dimension is one or two, this is the same as before. But this works in here. So this is the, main, the first theorem, and the proof is a standard. I mean, once you have that this is compact, and given that one knows that this is a submanifold without um, boundary, and also uh, as you assume that it is a compact, sorry, a non-compact Cauchy the surface, then you know your manifold is this product, and then you use the canonical project projection of this thing into sigma, and this will have to have a boundary because this is compact and this is not compact. But you know that this does not have a boundary, so that's the contradiction. Now you can also prove the hoping Penrose and White theorem. It's just the same. You assume here your new condition, and then you can uh, put an arbitrary trap to manifold with arbitrary dimensions, and the Penrose theorem works the same. Um, now some remarks here. If the co-dimension is one, then as I said, I don't need to assume one or anything else. If the co-dimension is two, I already showed that this is ex exactly the same as the null convergence condition, so you don't have to put here that you have already assumed convergence conditions. And the same happens if you put a point. So if you are putting co-dimension one, two, or n, which covers the original hoping Penrose theorem, then you don't have to assume this uh, or this substitution for the original condition. Now, I want to uh, remark that we can even do better. I mean, the new curvature condition can be weakened, and you don't even have to assume that you are dealing with a trap to manifold. The idea is that if you just assume this average condition, you have your sub-manifold, any co-dimension, you choose a normal, same notation as before, and now you take along any geodesic, which in principle is assumed to be complete, this integral, so the integral of this thing here. Now, if this happens to be greater than the expansion of the sub-manifold, then you can prove that there is a focal point. Now, the important thing about this is that I am not assuming anything about the sign of theta. So theta could even be positive or zero. So this is it even works for, um, for you know, weakly trapped or marginally trapped. Uh, also, I'm not restricting now the distance to the focal point, but this is not important. I'm not giving you a maximum distance to the focal point. So one can prove the Penrose and White theorem in an improved version. And now I don't, I mean, it's just the same as the Penrose theorem, but now I don't even assume a trapped submanifold. I don't need the thing to be trapped. I only need the, this to be a closed thing, so compact with the boundary and this condition. Could you, could yes. you, could you remind what you uh, expect from P? What conditions you impose on the tensor P? 
P. Yeah. Ah. yeah. P is like the projector. I'm coming back. Yeah. So P, you take the. Um, um, so this is like the projector to the submanifold, and then you parallel propagate this on the gamma. So you have here the projector, but then you can define this thing all along gamma, and the P is something which is orthogonal to N, right? And the derivative along N is always zero. So it's just parallel propagate. Okay, so where was I? Yeah. So as I said, for example, now one can use marginally trap or weekly trap or even minimal surfaces here as long as they are compact. And even untrapped submarinos. I mean, you only have to check that this is working. Now, what can we do with this new generalizing YD term? So I am choosing now, I mean, I think this opens uh, many lines of research, but I have chosen just a few. So the first thing is if we are in the four dimensional case, now the new possibility is the existence of trapped circles. So it's called dimension three. Dimension one. They are, have to be closed, so they are circles. Um, and of course, this may be relevant, and I will discuss this a lot in the case of cylindrical symmetry. Now, one can also use the results to prove singularities um, asymptotically the sitter or kind of the sitter like cosmologies. I mean, assuming that there is a, a positive cosmological constant. The problem with the positive cosmological constant is that the convergence conditions do not hold. The time-like convergence condition does not hold. So you, the traditional singularity theorem does not apply. So you, you need something else if you want to prove this. Now, uh, I want to remark that the condition one is satisfied strictly in uh, the Roberts and Walker geometries. And of course, then, this also holds in perturbations of Roberts and Walker. Now, the more obvious application of these theorems is to all these fancy new theories which have uh, a lot of dimensions. So if you are in a higher dimension of space-time, from the time, string, super string, whatever, then you have now a lot of possibilities to choose from. So if you are in dimension 11 or 10, so you have now 10 different possibilities to choose. And as a hopefully provocative example, I will discuss what is the possible instability of any compact extra dimension? And this is in the classical sense. So let me just talk about the four dimensional case. So you choose cylindrical symmetry. So you are in four dimensions. You can use the theorems, the new theorems, to apply them to closed, trapped, curves, or circles if you want. Now these are circles whose Acceleration is time-like. Very simple. Because the acceleration now is the new trajectory. Now, an obvious relevant example is if you are in, say, cylindrical symmetry. I mean, this is not the more general cylindrical symmetry to space-time, but I'm using the simplest one. So these are, I am assuming here that uh, parcel Z is a killing vector, and parcel phi 2, parcel phi is closed, and A, B, I, and E depend on P and Rho. Uh, this is cylindrical symmetric, and of course, there are some preferred surfaces here, which is the cylinders, the transitivity surfaces of the group of motions. But these cylinders cannot be used to prove anything like the theorems because they are non compact. Actually, there are many examples of cylindrical symmetric space time which are quite good behaved in, you know, in the case of. Uh, um, matter variables and all that, and they are non singular. But of course, here, the curves which have constant values of p, rho, and z are circles, so they are certainly closed. Now, the mean curvature vector is just proportional to the differential of f, so f is this function here. So, the causal character of this gradient of this function, which is just the norm of the Killing vector, characterizes the trapping of this circle. So many new results on incompleteness of geodesics can be found here by just dealing with this norm of the closed spinning vector. And also there arises a new hypersurface, which is where this 
uh, gradient of f when the space time becomes null, which is a kind of a horizon divided between trapped circles and non trapped circles. Now, considering the case of a, a positive cosmological constant. Now, this is the theorem. Now, you assume that you have a, a space time where all the um, non sectional curvatures are non positive. Now, suppose that you have a compact Cauchy-Hatter surface, and you assume that the second fundamental form is positive definite. So this is saying that your compact uh, so monitor, uh, hypersurface is expanding every, in all directions. So this is quite natural for cosmologists. Now, if the fundamental group of your submanifold is infinite, in a way, in a sense, it has a cardinality which is non-finite, so this is a typical thing, for example, you have a torus or things like that, then you can prove that uh, the manifold is past uh, geodesic and incomplete for the non geodesic. And uh, the important thing about this theorem, do not think about the detail, is that I'm not assuming the time lag convergence condition anywhere. So I don't have to worry about the sign of lambda, because I'm not assuming any energy condition if you want. I'm just assuming that I have a compact subset with the property, topological property. Now, as I remarked before, or previously, this, the, the time-like commodity condition does, does, does not hold if the cosmological constant is positive. And um, as I said, this condition is satisfied in Freeman and Robertson Walker models. So if you have generalized Robertson Walker models with topology in your space like part, which is non spherical, this is like a generalization, and this theorem will work. Now the proof is simple, even though sigma is compact, you choose any free homotopy class and then you can obtain, I mean, you will have many uh, lengths in this class, but given that you cannot cross these circles to a point because of the topology, then you will have one with a minimal length. And this is going to be geodesic, of course. And this is a closed geodesic. Now this closed geodesic, given that our assumption on sigma, uh, becomes a past trap circle in your space time, and then you can apply the Penrose and Wiley theorem, and still you don't get the contradiction because the initial, I mean the uh, Cauchy hypersurface that we assume is compact too. But then an elaborate argument going to the uh, covering of space time gives you the result. Now, of course, there is a dual version if your uh, space time is compact into the future. And now for the uh, Final example, I think I'm doing well. Is the analysis of the instability of any extra dimensions that you can have in your space time. Now, um, the, the original idea was due to Penrose in a paper published on the book uh, Celebrating Hawking, which was published uh, by Gibbons et al. And uh, he argued that singularities can develop within a tiny fraction of a second if your extra uh, space dimensions are very small. And his argument is quite simple. You just take the typical classical space time in the superstring theory. So this is just the product of your traditional space time manifold with the Calabi jaw six-dimensional compact manifold. So this is like the metric conjugate calabi part. This is the four-dimensional large visible space-time, and this is compact. And then in, in total, you have 10 dimensions. Now, he now splits the space-time into, say, time times a uh, space, uh, space uh, part. And he forgets about this space and the large space, and just considers the seven-dimensional space-time which is given by the time and the Calabria part. And now the metric is just the direct sum. Now you cannot apply the hawking penrose theorem because this is a seven-dimensional space-time with a compact hypersurface, and this will give you singularities. But of course, you have to do this splitting 
And you have to forget about this V3. And there is no kind of. So this was the original Penrose argument. Okay. But these uh, splittings and any um, other problems that arise in, in these arguments can be completely avoided by using the new theorems. And even you can use them to improve the arguments because you now you have many possibilities. It is not that you compact extra dimensional space or not the entirety, but any of its submanifolds, which are compact, satisfy the new trapping condition. That's what you need. Even more, one can not use this, but the improved version that I mentioned with the integral of this quantity along the units. So you don't even need that these compact submanifolds in the Calabrian job part are trapped. Now, if you do the, the, the typical calculation, one can easily check that the Calabrian Jaws submanifolds are minimal. So all the expansions are zero. This is because you have to split the space time in two parts. So all the expansions are zero, but if you want to use the average version, then you only need that this thing is positive along non geodesics or orthogonal to your Calabrian Jaws submanifold. If the manifold, I mean, if the space time is the trivial one as I showed, which is just the splitting of space, or the four dimensional part in the Calabrian, then actually this is zero too. So there's no singularity theorem. But this is, you know, very, very fine tuned. So any, any small, as small as you like, perturbation, so any Riemann thing arising there will kill you. And every some Riemann thing which crosses between the two things, we give this condition. But one can even do better, choose any compact to manifold within the Galileo part. Then the mean curvature vector is nothing but the mean curvature of this submanifold seen as a submanifold of the Galileo six dimensional part. Now, of course, this is a space like or zero. And now you can compute this function, and this function becomes essentially, and, and I'm using here notation by this is the Riemann tensor of the Galileo. These are the, the part of the normal n, which lives in the Calabria part, and g is nothing but the metric of the compact submanifold. So this is the thing that you have to control. For instance, if you choose a five-dimensional submanifold, this term is nothing but the rigid times the part of your non-normal, which lives in the Calabria part. And of course, there are so many, I mean, you have such a freedom to choose this submanifold that uh, controlling this uh, sign of the integrative condition here is very simple in principle. Anyway, I hope I convinced you that the bas basic argument by Penrose with this new uh, uh, possibility of arbitrary four dimension acquires a wider applicability. And you don't need any restrictions. And uh, this is actually uh, the end of the story. I only want to say that this all started in Warsaw some years ago. There was a meeting called Mathematics of Gravitation, which was actually organized by our chairman today. And here I presented these new results on the Minkervich vector, and I conjectured that probably one could prove similarity terms using this new definition. Now, this is the main theory, I'm sorry, the main paper, where you can find the main results. And this is a paper with this and many, many other things, which was published in the issue with milestones of general relativity in classical and quantum reality recently. And uh, um, thank you for your attention. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the past uh, incompleteness of the asymptotic periodic statement. Does it include the exact logic statement? Include what? Exact logic statement. No, 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 no. Well, maybe I didn't explain this properly. I mean, I call them asymptotically the sitter because I, I am assuming that positive cosmological constant. But if your, um, say, uh, topology of the state is in the sphere, S3, then the theorem does not apply, and this includes the sitter.
uh, in the interstate and railway the asymptotically flat section, spatially flat section, through it. Given the theorem, or, uh, I mean, to prove this past incompleteness, you either use the traditional theorems or you use a kind of uh, non trivial topology in the space. And then you can include the cosmological constant. But if things are close to, to real the Zeta, then the Zeta is non singular and the principal relations of it is not singular. They are not singular. Can you apply your results to inflationary theories where there is a quasi decitter case, not exactly the sitter? I mean, there are these theorems by border groups and relations. Yes. Uh, is there some relationship with this? Yes, yes, of course. Um, well, the idea is just to take these theorems by Borde and uh, the 19, and, and I don't remember how that's. And um, do the same. I mean, they rely on the traditional singularity theorems, and then they care about the kind of integral on, of the uh, Hubble parameter to the past. And uh, of course, this could be done in exactly the same way, but not assume an electric flat surface or a compact uh, space like I mean, a closed universe. You could do that with many other. Trap should manifold so you have many dimensions, including trap circles. You only, you only need to control this. Yes. Thank you. Okay, please, yes, please. Um, so, I mean, as you, as you point out, um, there's a sense in which um, the strong energy condition or the you know, time like convergence condition, if you prefer, um, has sort of fallen on hard times, right? Because um, in the guise of a of a cosmo positive cosmological constant, it's inconsistent with inflation, and therefore our best theory of the real universe. It's inconsistent with dark energy, um, and therefore our best observations of the current universe. And it's inconsistent with a massive scalar field, and therefore inconsistent with the Higgs boson, and therefore our latest you know, particle uh, uh, experiments. So, um, you know, but I mean, it's still okay as a piece of mathematics, but, but you know, we don't, we don't necessarily like it as, as a physical theory. Um, whereas, you know, in contrast, the null convergence condition is, is still in good shape, um, you know, except for possible quantum corrections or something. So for, for these more general convergence conditions that, that you're writing down, is, is there a way of, um, you know, trying to figure out whether, you know, which ones of them are likely to be satisfied by our favorite physical theories and which ones aren't? Yeah, I mean, this can be worked out. I mean, I have only... Um, analyze some of the very, very simple cases, but I mean, you can just take this condition and analyze how this um, translates into the, all these cases, like if you have a scalar field or if you have inflation and all that. And um, I want to stress that if you use the milder condition, which is not this thing being positive, but the integral of that greater than the initial expansion, then you have, a, I mean, you have a, a lot of freedom to satisfy this condition. So yes, I think that this widely opens the applicability of the theorems, including cases with the positive cosmological constant or the scalar field. Okay. You spoke about the instability of uh, Calabi applications in particular. Is there any understanding? Uh, what happens once you include higher curvature for other Well, the principal things are, the, are even worse. If you, I mean, if you, uh, yeah, if you take the entire expansion of the of the Lagrangian, in principle, this is argued by Penrose, things get worse and worse when you assume higher order curvature corrections. He also does other arguments concerning the degrees of freedom of your equations, and he argues that this is something very wrong. I want to stress anyway that as I have done the, I mean, the way I presented the results, they are independent of any theory. So this they apply to GR, to string theory, to whatever. The only need the dimension you are 
and then you need to control whether your Riemann tensor satisfies this condition or not. And this is linear in the Riemann tensor. That's it. Now this could be yes or no, and then if you have a particular solution of a particular theory, then you will have to argue on this test. But this is independent. Okay. But yes, please. Um, also in the context of these uh, spatial extra dimensions, um, how did Penrose get the time scale of the fraction of a second? This well, this was a typical argument that you assume Calabi-Yau uh, dimensions to be of Planck uh, uh, size. So the radius of any circle there or things like that should be like uh, of the order of the Planck length. And then you assume that the time is going to be of the same order. And then this gives you time, uh, uh, plan time. So or maybe 10 times plan time, but this is just a very, very short time. Yeah. Okay, but basically a dimensional argument. Yeah, in that case it is, but I mean, uh, this is that you can make it more formal. I mean, you just, because, for example, if you use the traditional Penrose similarity theorem, then you know when the similarity is going to happen. I mean, it has to be less than this, uh, whatever. I mean, that the uh, affine parameter along the, your initial expansion. So it's one over your expansions, and you just take this Clavillo thing and compute it, and in principle, it will give you something which is of the order of one over the radius, I think. No, the radius, yeah. <laughs> because it's one over theta. Okay, I think it's like time plan in music. Yeah. Plan. Yeah. So thank you, Tanvay Sanjay.